During excavations within the Kiziltepe district of southeastern Mardin in southeast Turkey, a marvelous, miraculous, and to this day unexplained artifact was discovered. A pure nugget of historical gold, ticking all the boxes of desirability when it comes to our research here at Mystery History. The wheel is by far the most important invention man has ever realized, and it is indeed recognized as such the world over. The official attested account for the origin of the wheel is given to the late Aceramic Neolithic between 9500 to 6500 BCE and could be seen in conjunction with other technological advances as that which gave rise to the early Bronze Age. The official kept academic record regarding the evolution of the wheel is largely accepted as follows. 4500 to 3300 BCE, Chalcolithic era, invention of the potter's wheel. 3300 to 2200 BCE, early Bronze Age. 2200 to 1550 BCE, middle Bronze Age, invention of the spoked wheel and the chariot. When, on occasion, we are confronted with artifacts reluctantly accepted by these same academic fields of study as authentic, demonstrating through their existence that mainstream paradigm is to be vastly incorrect, we feel a mix of frustration and vindication. We also strongly feel that it is imperative we share such finds with one another to further all of our understandings regarding our past to hopefully break the spell slowly cast over years of incorrect and largely incomplete information. According to the culture and tourism director of Marden, Davut Belikte, the car is like a copy of cars today. He also pointed out that the shape of this ancient toy resembles that of a tractor. Belikte revealed that strange toy dolls and whistles, also made of stone, were also found at the site. We believe that the whistles and dolls to be well over 5,000 to 6,000 years old, with the whistles still in working condition, he said. Along with these ancient figurines was also a mysterious stone tablet, inscribed with an ancient text. After extensive historical analysis, the writing on the 5 centimeter long stone was deemed to be that of an ancient title deed. The content of the deed refers to a fruit garden and the fruit trees within, which are to be split between the three sons of the owner. Clearly, the behavior of people far more advanced than that of Stone Age people, a premise we are expected to believe is accurate. Belikte has confirmed that comprehensive information on the two finds will be provided soon. Is this little ancient toy car perhaps the earliest evidence of the wheel we will ever find? Or is it just the tip of an evidential iceberg? of a secret far larger. Every now and again, you stumble across an artifact, an ancient relic so astonishing, with such an enigmatic history and indeed properties. Only the most reliable of sources will suffice in satisfying doubts regarding authenticity, which will inevitably surround such objects. Impossible artifacts are extremely hard for some to digest, especially those with careers built around a paradigm which said objects suggest were constructed upon a lie. Sir David Brewster must have experienced this personally, yet regardless, he still courageously brought the object before the dragons, or more specifically, the American Journal of Science. Quote, I have to bring before the section an object so incredible, only the strongest evidence could render the statement at all probable. It is an authentic ancient rock crystal lens. End quote. Roughly translated, Sir David had put his neck on the line for the truth, a truth which speaks of ancient advanced technologies. Discovered amongst the ruins of the treasure house at Nineveh, it had lay, undoubtedly for many centuries, possibly even millennia, within the ruins of this once magnificent city. Although many have attempted to discredit the lens as a mere ornament, Sir David Brewster has courageously fought on regardless arguing against such claims by stating that the convex nature of the lens, along with mysterious ancient gases and liquids which were once encased within the lens, made it a once efficient optical magnifier. It still has the remnants of 12 cavities upon it, which once contained some form of liquid or gas. 10 had been opened through damage over the eons, yet remarkably, two were seemingly still intact. 
the surface of the remaining cavities, Sir David claimed, were speckled with amazingly iridescent spots, far more vivid than a peacock spots, known now as the Nimrod lens. Italian scientist Giovanni Pettinato of Rome proposed in Babylonian astronomy that the lens was used by the ancient Assyrians as part of their telescope, explaining their detailed knowledge of astronomy, in particular Saturn. The ancient Assyrians were able to see Saturn, believing it to be a god surrounded by a ring of serpents. The British Museum's curator proposed that the lens could have been used as a piece of inlay, perhaps for furniture or for magnification purposes, such as starting fires. Yet no mention of the mysterious gaseous fluids which was said to have once filled the original relic. Unfortunately, we may never know what happened to the authentic liquid-filled original artifact, and although it is claimed that the Nimrod lens is on public display at the British Museum, it is rarely spotted. We find the claims made by Sir David Brewster to have been highly compelling, though unfortunately, they may never be taken further. The chronological dating of our technological development and capabilities within antiquity are often correlated and judged upon the developments within heat management of metal refinery. For example, one of our strongest arguments against the modern-day attested view that ancient Egyptians were the builders of the Sphinx, the pyramids, the tombs, etc., is partly based upon their lack of ability in heating a furnace to a sufficient enough temperature to create the hardened metal tools needed to penetrate and carve such hard stones. The Nanjing Belt is an extremely rare find that has unsurprisingly vanished from public view, preventing any further analysis, although the existence of these artifacts was officially noted in several places and was indeed analyzed by several specialists. What is amazing regarding the Nanjing Belt is its age, but most importantly, what it is made of. In 1952, two tombs were found within Yixing City in China. One of the tombs also had a clear date inscribed upon its inside. It stated that they were buried on the 20th of September of the seventh year of Yuan Kang, the late general of Zhao, 1700 years ago. When the belt was initially retrieved, it was sent for analysis at the chemistry department of Nanjing University. The results were astonishing. 10% copper, 5% manganese, and the remaining was 85% pure aluminum. However, the development of aluminum is a very modern achievement, requiring extreme heats to smelt, heats that we believe were impossible to manage at the time. Alumina is dissolved in molten cryolite at 1000 degrees C, with a melting point of pure alumina being 2054 degrees Celsius. So, the question persists. How could such an artifact exist? A question once taken up in the West by three scholars, Butler, Glidewell, and Pritchard at St. Andrews University. The abstract sums up their work, quote, Pieces of aluminum, supposedly parts of a set of belt ornaments, were found in a Jing Dynasty tomb during excavations in the 1950s. The authenticity of these finds was questioned at the time in view of the technology required to isolate aluminum from its ore. Examination of the thermodynamic requirement for this process demonstrates unequivocally that the temperature required for this process is greatly in excess of that possible with Jing Dynasty technology, and so the finds cannot be authentic. Unfortunately, again, we find ourselves in familiar waters. So-called scholars, three in fact, with a conclusion based solely upon historical assumptions. Unfortunately, the artifact was seemingly too controversial for some, and it has disappeared, sadly, quite possibly forever. Found in the ruins of Chan Chan, Peru, this delicate yet clearly astonishing ancient communication device was made nearly 2,000 years ago by a culture rarely mentioned within mainstream archaeology. The cup and string telephone is a device used within the modern era as a simple demonstration of how invisible sound waves interact with our environment. The question is, how did this elusive, ancient Peruvian culture manage to figure this out, not only learn how sound works, but to utilize these characteristics for their own advantage? 
When one mentions an advanced ancient civilization which once resided within the mountains of Peru, many immediately think of the Incan Empire. And for good reason, it seems that within modern academia, most of the advanced cultural remnants which were left upon the surrounding environment is often explained away as being that of the Incas, including most controversial and currently unexplained archaeology and ancient architecture. However, what many were not aware of is another culture which once presided within very ancient Peru. At the same time as the Incan civilization was flourishing, another enigmatic culture was growing and developing its own, along with their own series of marvelous ancient high technologies, architecture and lost knowledge, which we are still astounded by to this day. The Chimu, known to have worshipped the moon, which they considered more powerful than the sun, which was preferred by the Inca Empire. The two cultures eventually went to war, with the Incas subsequently invading the Chimu, wiping them out a mere 50 years before the arrival of the Spanish into the region, who consequently chronicled the area for our modern history books. They were able to record brief accounts of Chimu culture from individuals who had lived before the Inca conquest, but unfortunately, the information was limited. This elusive and extremely ancient culture, it seems, had mastered the technology of the telephone, or more accurately, were somehow aware of how sound waves work, using this awareness to create a primitive form of telephonic communication device in the form of a string and cups. Did the Chimu, along with the Incas, come into contact with an advanced ancient race of otherworldly visitors? There are many questions left unanswered throughout our world. But the more we realize regarding the unexplainable, the closer we get to a true understanding of the history upon our Earth. Many inventions found throughout the world have their origins set in the Far East. Many machines that different nations claim as their own can often be found to have primitive traces of development many centuries earlier within China. And our next artifact is no exception. Dating back over 2,000 years, this rare and enigmatic piece of once very high technology can only be seen as a demonstration of their superior ingenuity. It seems the invention of the first seismoscope can be traced back to 132 AD, when a Chinese inventor called Chang Heng perfected a device remarkably accurate at detecting earthquakes, even from afar. Although the ancient Chinese did not fully understand the cause of earthquakes, they did see it as very important to keep track of such events, perceiving these disturbances with cosmic yin and yang. It was, therefore, important for the Chinese emperor to be alerted of any earthquakes occurring anywhere in their kingdom. Chang's ingenious seismoscope was almost six feet across and made of solid bronze, decorated with eight dragons marking compass directions. Within each dragon's mouth was a small bronze ball, and beneath sat eight bronze toads. A mechanism within would somehow detect an earthquake occurring in the distance. This would then cause a ball to drop out of one of the eight dragon's mouths. What is fascinating regarding Chang's invention is the fact that no one seems to be able to figure out for a certainty how it worked. One theory is that a thin stick set loosely down the center of the barrel. When an earthquake occurred, a stick would topple over in the direction of the seismic shock. According to legend, when Chang first showed his invention to the emperor, it indicated that a quake had occurred to the west of Luyang, the capital city at the time. A few days later, a messenger from the region arrived reporting that there had indeed been an earthquake there, around the time Chang's machine had indicated. When specialists first realized what the machine was, they struggled to believe that this 2,000-year-old invention could actually work. So, in 2005, scientists in Zhenzhou, China used it to detect several earthquakes. The seismoscope detected all of them. In fact, the data gathered from this 2,000-year-old machine corresponded with that gathered by modern-day seismometers, a marvelous machine left to us by a once ingenious civilization.